Thank you to Blackology Coffee Company for sponsoring this video. Take 10% off your next order at Blackology Coffee Company by using the link at the description, www.blackologycoffeecompany.com backslash Angela. Hey everyone, my name is Angela. I'm your host and producer here at Honey and Hustle. And today I'm joined by Nancy Murphy, the founder of CSR Communications. She's joining me from just outside of DC. So I'm super excited to have another East Coast person here on the show with me. Nancy, how are you doing today? I'm great, Angela. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in addition to CSR Communications, you have started something called the Entrepreneur's Influence Lab. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that got started? Yeah, so I would say for my whole life, I've been that internal change agent, that kind of agitator bucking the status quo, um, starting from my Catholic school days up through pretty much every job that I had. And when I started my own business, I realized that a lot of the clients who were coming to me for help were also those kinds of people within their organizations. And I realized that I had a lot of lessons that I had learned along the way about how to advocate change in ways that other people are open to listening and how to actually succeed in realizing a vision for change. And so I put all that together in 2018 when I created this lab, which is really designed to be an experimentation space, you know, a space that will really encourage people to try things out, to test some of these tools and techniques and to learn from them and to keep improving along the way. So that's why it's called a lab. And it brings a lot of the lessons that I learned the hard way and the solutions that I discovered through my entrepreneurial journey um, to other leaders in similar situations. Right, right. So you have since transitioned from being an entrepreneur yourself to now being an entrepreneur. Um, so in terms of creating an environment where entrepreneurs who may be with your company now can thrive and feel agency to create change within your organization, what has that shifting dynamic been like for you? <laughs> well, it's not always easy. <laughs> I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, we often like to think of ourselves as people who are um, risk takers and who love change and her, who are open to new ideas. You know, we're the disruptors in our organizations or in our industries, and that's why we became entrepreneurs. And yet, when it comes to people who might challenge or try to shape or tweak our ideas or bring new ideas to the table, we're oftentimes not as open <laughs> as we might think, or we're not as ready to take a risk on someone else's idea as we might be on our own. And so I would say, you know, that's a journey that I'm still on in terms of all the things that I teach to intrapreneurs about um, how to be open to resistance and to see resistance to change as a positive thing because it illuminates our blind spots and it makes our ideas stronger and how can we get curious not furious and how do we look in the mirror and make sure that we're that credible leader of change that we're open to change that we're willing to change ourselves and so the more I teach those things, the more I remind myself as well. So it can be very helpful because I'm, you know, like I said, I'm still on that journey and it's not always easy, but it's a work in progress. Okay. Okay. Good to know that we, we always have learning to do. Learning yeah. is um, And I think that applies so well to entrepreneurship, no matter where you are in your career and your journey or within an organization, um, that there's always learning to be done. Right. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this probably shift as like when, from when you started in 2018, the entrepreneurs uh, influence lab to what it is now, like the conversations that you're having and <laughs> things like that. Um, they're always shifting. You're always learning new, new material and trying to apply that and help people get the most out of just learning how to be a change agent. Um, Yes. One of the one of my personal mantras, which we've now created a whole scorecard for the lab that the participants use, 
is always in beta. So, you know, we're never done, right? We're always continuing to improve and learn. And sometimes we slide back a little bit, but as long as we have that sort of always improving mindset, I think that makes a huge difference. So that's a key component of what I teach for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and for people who are maybe let's say in a larger corporation, which is typically the type of entrepreneurs that you work with, uh, for people who may be coming into the workforce right now, who maybe don't have a lot of corporate experience, um, how would you suggest they go about, one, finding agency for themselves if they're looking to maybe work with a startup, because that's a completely different environment, right? You have a lot closer interaction with the person that you're pitching an idea to. Um, so how have you seen like people adapting to this new, I say, it's, I feel like it's fairly new uh, way of thinking where it's like everybody is not going to be able to find a job in the traditional sense anymore. Um, and there are a lot of startups who are looking to gain talent and looking to provide this atmosphere that people can find agency within their own company. Um, and so for people coming into that as an entrepreneur, whether they have a certain level of experience or not, what have you seen in terms of just like the learning and professional development side of things for entrepreneurs? And what is, do you feel would be helpful for someone who is looking to be um, a part of a startup, a part of maybe a smaller enterprise? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say maybe I would answer your question with the framing of leadership more broadly versus thinking about change leadership or entrepreneurship specifically, because I believe that everyone can be a leader in her or his own way. So there might be formal authority, there might be informal authority. So even a small organization, can you be a leader of you know, a particular area of expertise that you bring, or you maybe if you're the youngest or the least experienced person, you might have a fresh perspective, right? You might not be locked into a whole bunch of assumptions and beliefs about how things have to happen. And so if we think about leaders with a small L, right, we all have agency, we all have something to contribute. So how do we start to see ourselves in that way? to appreciate the unique talent, skills, and perspectives that we can bring to the table, and then learn how to share those in a way that other people will receive them with the intent that, that we have, right? So sometimes I think we've all been in those places where we have an idea or a perspective that we believe is 100% right and everything else is wrong and the way people have been doing things up to this point is just crazy and old fashioned and inefficient and ineffective and and we get so um, we fall so in love with our own idea and our own brilliance that we sometimes forget to do that you know 360 view if you will and and understand how the perspective of others who might be hearing our idea or our brilliant perspective for the first time. And we forget that we need to be a little bit of a salesperson, that we might need to appreciate that the process or the concept or the approach that we're we're suggesting tweaks to might have been developed by the person that we're now pitching our idea to and their identity might be really tied up in that. So how can we appreciate that? And, you know, I'm not saying that we want to be like overly accommodating. You know, I think especially as women, sometimes we need to be a little comfortable being a little more assertive than we might initially think. Um, <laughs> And at the same time, there's a way to be firm and assertive, but to use these influence and persuasion skills in a way that have our idea received the way that we want it to. Like we want, we're putting ideas out there because we want someone to act on them, right? So why not use all of the influence and persuasion skills and tools at our disposal so that we're more likely to have those ideas received well? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I appreciate you making that distinction too, because I think at least when I was in corporate America or had a nine to five, it was hard to me, hard for me to see myself as a leader within that organization because I was like the US hire, I was the youngest hire. And I just was like finding it difficult to feel 
agency within my position within that company. Uh, and especially when you don't have experience or haven't had mentorship in the area of thinking of yourself in that way and learning how to communicate effectively with the team when you have new ideas that may be different from ones that they are accustomed to, um, that can really be a difficult, um, I guess just like environment to feel, to thrive in, in some ways, you know what I mean? Um, so I think it's, it's very important for us to start this shift at every level of what it means to be an entrepreneur, what it means to be a leader, um, and what that environment looks like, because it may look different for different people. So. Absolutely. That's such a great point. And I'm really glad you mentioned that, Angela, because a mantra I've adopted this year, and I mean, it's sad that it took me to, I won't say how old I am, but it's sad that it took me to this point in my professional life to fully appreciate this and embrace it. But, you know, I think it's easy to read a lot of leadership books or to get advice or, you know, re, you know, sort of learn the formal leadership and feel like we've now got to become that to be a leader. And my mantra this year is I'm only going to do that or try that approach if I can do it in a way that feels naturally Nancy. Like if I'm having to be a different person to feel like I can step into a certain role or leadership position or to, you know, be a podcast guest or whatever, but I can't do it as naturally Nancy, then I don't want to do it. And so how can we find that voice that feels like our natural leadership style and not try to, you know, put on clothes that don't really fit us just because somebody handed them to us and said, this is, these are the clothes a leader wears. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And I, I, I agree. I think too, like a lot of leadership books and a lot of leadership teachings really speak to people who are already extroverted, um, mm -hmm. and who are already used to just like communicating so, so much with different types of people, different groups of people all the time, not even all the time, but just a lot more frequently than what somebody like me, who's a little more naturally introverted might, right? Um, and so for a minute, you know, too, I thought like the odds were stacked against me to be a successful business owner because I was introverted. Um, but that's not really the case, right? I mean, there's uh, positivity and negativity, negativity and everything if you look for it, you know, it's all about how you see it. And in some ways, too, just like learning the qualities about yourself that may be considered not conducive for a business environment, learning how to um, use them in a conducive manner that it that works for you could also be your superpower, right? So like, yes, I'm introverted, but when I began networking in person, I saw that my strength was really not trying to talk to everybody in the room, but create deep right. connections with five people in the room and then get a one-on-one -on -one with them, maybe outside of that environment and developing deeper relationships. That, and these are people that I still talk to today. So it doesn't, you don't have to necessarily fit a certain mold or a certain cast in order to be successful as a leader, in my opinion. But Oh, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And I love that you described that as your as your superpower. You know, how do we how do we strive in our leadership to be the best version of ourselves? So we can all improve and we can, you know, learn to complement some things that we may not be as strong as others in. And we can learn to use the gifts we have in the most effective way possible. So true, you might not be the social butterfly flitting around the room at a reception, but I bet you're also not the person who goes up and introduces themselves to someone, finds out that maybe they're not, you know, the person who can do as much for them as they had hoped. And they're always looking over the shoulder to see who else they can go meet. And that's super annoying, I think. You know, if you're that person who's like, I'm only gonna talk to five people at this reception, but I'm gonna have really great, deep, meaningful conversations. And I'm gonna be really interested in the other person because that makes me a little more comfortable, right? To ask them about them, which I bet is one of the things you do really well, which is why you're a podcast host. And so again, how can we embrace becoming the best version of ourselves as leaders? And again, not trying to put on those clothes that don't really fit us because someone else told us that's the uniform that we're supposed to wear. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so one running joke that I've seen um, that people make about like startups or people who have maybe started working at a startup 
Um, and typically startups, they just don't have the capital that bigger corporations do. Um, and so one joke that people make is like, oh man, we finished this great big product project for this startup and now we're getting a pizza party, right? So it's this element of like, <laughs> maybe not feeling so, so appreciated at work, even though it's, it's a joke. I mean, obviously a lot of people love have loved their experiences working with the startup, whether or not they stay there for a long time, whole other story. But, you know, what do you feel are some ways that, you know, again, we can show appreciation for the newer members on our team or the entrepreneurs on our team. And again, just make them feel appreciated for the hard work that they put in and for the leadership that they show on different projects and within their expertise. Well, so first of all, I think being an entrepreneur inside a large organization is not for everyone. That is an incredibly challenging place to be. It can feel like you're beating your head against the wall, um, that you're, you know, oftentimes the colleague that people hide from in the hallway because they're sick of the broken record telling them all the things that the organization should be doing differently all the time. And yet some people, that's their space, you know, that's where they're going to thrive. It's not for everyone, but it is for some people. Just like being in a startup is not for everyone. Not everyone is going to thrive in that environment. If you're the kind of person who likes predictability, a lot of structure, adequate resources, consistent resources, then you're probably not going to thrive in a startup environment. And that's not good or bad, right or wrong. Thank goodness we have all these different kinds of workplaces so that everyone can find the space where they thrive. So I think, first of all, if people are expecting that there's going to be a huge bonus or um, a salesperson's, top salesperson's retreat in Hawaii, all expenses paid, and they're in a startup, well, they're going to be hugely disappointed. So make sure that you're in the right environment for you, first of all, and, and that as the, if you're the entrepreneur, that you're hiring people who are comfortable with, who understand the constraints and the opportunities of that environment. So that would be my first tip. Secondly, I would say, one of my favorite um, books is the the five love languages, Gary Chapman, and you know they they're uh, I think it's Paul White who's adapted that for the five appreciation languages at work, and so not everyone is going to love a pizza party, but some people will really love a pizza party. Other people would like you know, verbal thank you, gratitude, specific recognition for their contribution and for however they, you know, helped support that big project. Other people might like something different. So how do we identify the kind of appreciation that's going to have meaning with our teams and then give people that appreciation that is how they will feel appreciated, right? And I think that, yeah, I'm sure some people are sitting here listening to this going, but gosh, that takes a lot of work. Now I got to get to know all of my employees. Well, yes. If you're in a startup, it's likely small. <laughs> and if you don't have a lot of money to throw around, which in some ways is not how everyone's going to feel appreciated anyway, then it's probably worth spending a little bit of time to learn about your team and to appreciate them in the ways that they want to be appreciated. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, yeah, and again, that it goes back to different leadership styles and just like, in my opinion, having com compassion as a leader. I think that's like so important. Maybe not everybody agrees with that because they feel that they make better decisions without emotions. And that's not saying that you have to be super emotional with every decision, but it is saying that like, you have an emotional connection to your business at the very least right and just like people have an emotional connection with the work that they do if they feel like they're working at a startup because they want to be in a space where they can use their skills um, for a specific purpose right and so you have to be respective of that as well i feel that's where like that relationship and that connection is going to come from even if you're not the most outwardly emotionally expressive person which i can't say that i am either but I understand who I am as a business leader and as a business owner, and I understand why people are working with me. 
at the very least, I understand that much and I appreciate them for that. And so it's important to me to show my appreciation, right? Because well, and one of the things I will tell you is I think the most powerful demonstration of appreciation that I've ever been able to offer and probably that I've received is a personal handwritten note. It can take five minutes to do. And if there's one sentence in there that's something specific about that person's contribution, I know people who save those things forever. I actually myself have what I call a good mojo file. And I encourage some of the leaders I work with to do that. I use my OneNote for this and I'll take a picture of cards like that, that people send or little handwritten notes. And on those days when I'm not feeling particularly appreciated or particularly effective, I might just dip in there and read a little bit of those notes. And it kind of gives me that confidence boost again, or makes me feel like, yes, I, you know, I can do this. I've done it before. And so a personal handwritten note that you can do in five or 10 minutes can be very, very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I started that. That was a part of my like client experience when I first started as a photographer, freelance photographer. That was one of my client gifts. I would give them like a, a handwritten thank you note and uh, like 10% off if they referred me to somebody else or something. And in my head, I'm like, nobody appreciates this. Nobody cares. This is just something that, that I do because I appreciate little things like that. But it paid off. You know what I mean? Because there's always that one person. As soon as you think, oh, this isn't <laughs> worth the effort. This isn't worth my time. Nobody cares about this little gesture that I'm making. It's always going to be that one person that you wouldn't think is like, thank you so much. I got your thank you card, blah, blah, blah. Like, don't discount just putting in a little bit of effort to make things personal and to make things um, just real for people and appreciate them. Yes. Thank you so much, Nancy, for joining me today. I super appreciate all the tips that you shared for me and for the entrepreneurs watching this. Entrepreneurs, you guys, hey, pay attention. You got, you know what you have to do now. You have your, just your moving orders. So <laughs> get to it. Um, you know, a lot of great things can happen when we collaborate effectively and we, when we create an environment for our team to work collaboratively. Um, so thank you again, Nancy, for sharing your expertise with me today. Thanks for having me, Angela. Yeah.